I am so excited for this next fireside chat, and I'd like to introduce Dr. David Laborde, the Agri-Food Economics and Policy Division Director at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Round of applause. Nice to see you, David. And I get to introduce Richard Zaltzman, the CEO of EIT Food. Round of applause. Nice to see you. So, I, this is really a question for you both because so much has been going on this week. What have you seen and heard so far that, thank you for the shh, everyone quiet down. Um, what have you both seen and heard so far, again, that makes you inspired or pisses you off? Wow, that's a big question. Bang, straight in. Um, <laughs> Let's start with the, the inspired. I think, first of all, just the, sh the, the sheer number of people having the right conversations. Yeah. So uh, the work you're doing here at Food Tank, Regen House, some of the corporate events, there is a real desire to be involved in the conversations we absolutely need to have. Yeah. And I think that's this is my first climate week. We're kind of building on the COP feeling. It feels there's more purpose in that attendance. Mm, nice. Kind of pisses me off. I, su I suppose just the the lack of understanding of what some of this food system transition might take, especially, sorry to any bankers in the room, um, especially in the finance side, that the, there's this idea you switch it on like pumping VC money into a tech startup right, and bang, right. it'll all change. And there's, you've, you've got to really understand the dynamics in food systems. I love that point. Listen up, bankers. David. So on the good side, I think that uh, we have very diversity of actors talking with each other and having the difficult discussion. And so far, a lot of the problem we had in the agri-food system world is these silos, mm -hmm. and now we are starting to break them. Now people are talking with each other, but not exactly in with the same language. Right, right. So that's a bit of a problem, and we are still in a world where people try to oversimplify many stories, always saying the good, the bad, uh, when uh, we really have a, a continuum of, of solution, a continuum mm -hmm. of factors, and oversimplification is not going to help us, no. even if it makes the story more attractive for some people. <laughs> right, that's such a valuable point that we all need to have, be using different vocabulary, different semantics. We are not speaking the same language and, and you're right, you do have a tendency to oversimplify if, if you're not. How do we break out of that, do you think? Well, for us in particular at FAO, uh, we like data, we like numbers. At least people can speak this universal language, a number is a number after you can interpret it differently, but the starting point, you know, going back yeah. to fact, going back to evidence. Science. We're not here to discuss opinions. Right. We agree on the fact, and from there we design the solutions. And for that, that's the key starting point. Excellent, thank you. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I, I suppose, as well as the facts and the data, it's, it's that understanding of the voices that really matter. And the farmers, the farmer's voice and the, the people who put everything on the line in the food system yeah. is woefully underrepresented. You know, I'm not a farmer, and I'm acutely conscious of how many cock-ups I make when I make assumptions about what life will be like if we do certain things. Mm -hmm. So that, that understanding of data is absolutely critical, as is, especially from the corporate perspective, really putting aside your own corporate ego and understanding what, what does it take to put a family farm on the line if you're right. really asking for change. Right, e excellent points. Um, this is for both of you, and this is not, you know, I'm not talking about the people in this room, obviously, but for many people, you know, who are not seeing or ignoring the effects of climate change every day, they think it's something that's far in the future, and then there are, of course, still people who deny that, that the climate crisis is happening. Do, do you think that we can communicate effectively that we are in an emergency, and because it's an emergency, we need to do something about it? Uh, I think so, So, and that's where the two sides of the, the farmers and the data come together. Ask a farmer, they will tell you that climate change is a reality, it's not the next generation, it's now, and they are on the front line. Now, as it has been said, they are a bit underrepresented in New York this time, yeah. and sometimes people blame them, okay? Right. Farmers are killing the planet. No, they are not killing the planet. They are feeding us. It's already challenging. And as of today, we have, of course, the climate uh, crisis, but we are still in a food security and nutrition crisis. We have 733 million people that are in chronic hunger. One person over 11 go in a regular manner um, hungry when go to bed. 2.3 billion people doesn't are food insecure. 2.8 billion cannot afford a healthy diet. 
And so we have to tackle these two crises yeah. at the same time. Yeah. And uh, not blaming the farmers, but I finding a solution for them. Absolutely. Richard? I, you know, I, anyone on the front line feels climate change day in, day out. And I'm, I remember recently I asked a farmer, a potato farmer, like, what's the, what's the increase in incidence of crop failure for your potatoes? And she said, look, actually, we look at it a different way around. Um, we look at how often are we successful. So we used to have a crop that allowed us to make a profit maybe every three, possibly four years. Mm. So that's, we'd have an investment cycle, we'd buy the new kit, we'd tidy up the farm every three or four years. Now it's every five to seven years. So you know, farmers and, and others in the sector are on the front line. The bit where it's very still immaterial, I think, is in, in spaces where people are, again, making assumptions that, and, and it's not being felt. And that's where, I, I don't know, personal view is the, the scaremongering isn't working. Right. Um, so if you look at the, again, take a boardroom, right? There are no, probably no people in that boardroom. Or maybe I'm making a gross generalization, but I doubt any people in a boardroom in New York have gone a day without a meal. And, and my, I myself, you know, I, I haven't had not, I've not had a day without a meal because I couldn't afford one or find right, one. Right. Um, so that, it's very immaterial to some of the people who uh, are in yeah. decision-making spaces. Yeah. The conversation I would love to have, g given that fear-mongering doesn't seem to work, is one about legacy. And I think you touched on this earlier in the week um, and at the, the dinner the other night. What's the, what's the story you want to have with your kids and your grandkids? Yeah. You know, you, you're, you're a leader in a flagship organization, or not, you know, doesn't really matter how big you are, but at the end of it all, as you look back on it, what are you gonna be proud of and what are you, what are you gonna regret? And what are your kids or friends or family or the history books gonna make of you? I think that maybe that's an angle that yeah. actually triggers people to think, I'm gonna be a lot ballsier with my shareholders. I'm gonna <laughs> tell them this is gonna go down before it goes up. Yeah. And there are great examples of that in different spaces, but it's not pervasive enough. No, it is not pervasive enough. And I, I, it, we do have to flip the, the story. I'm wondering, you know, when we talk about climate solutions, we talk about both mitigation and adaptation, but I'm wondering if, if you can both talk about how far adaptation can really take us. So, I mean, first in agriculture, sometimes the solution are going to deliver benefits on both. So that's part of the silo. You know, it's not adaptation on one side and mitigation on the other. We right. can deliver on both. Now, we are not going to adapt at a three degree or four degree Celsius increase in temperature, at least not everyone. And I think that's very important is sure. the question of fairness and inequality. Sure. Rich people, high income countries will be able to mobilize finance technology to adapt their uh, agri-food system. And moreover, they are not in the tropical area when a lot of the low and middle income countries are in the tropical area, they are going to be hurt heavily. They are already hurt heavily and they will not have the capacity. So that's why we really need to keep the agenda on both sides alive. Yeah. Without adaptation, we will not get food security and nutrition. And if we don't do more on mitigation, we will never be able to adapt at the scale we are. We well said, thank you. Yeah, look, the, there is a, adaptation is non-linear. It's gonna top out. Um, as does something like carbon, again, there's so many parallels here. I had a lot of conversations with companies about carbon banking in farming. So and you talk to them and, and you realize suddenly there's this assumption that it's going to be continued linear at, at least growth, if not nice exponential growth, like a stock price. You sit them down and say, have you ever actually dug into the ground and lifted it up? It's not just dark black carbon. It's, it's a m mineral mix, right? So we're not, this idea of linear response is a, is very misleading. Yeah. Adaptation is going to top out. Um, it may be time to consider what some are thinking about as extreme mitigation, things like geoengineering, um, when you look at the potential for hundreds of millions of people to be displaced if you don't start taking radical measures <coughs> in some places. So I think, the, again, the, the assumption that we can change the farming system and adapt, <coughs> as well as have a positive impact on mitigation, it's one that what does that look like in a non-linear system? Mm -hmm. That's that's very poorly understood at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. I, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about culture because when we talk about, you know, um, the climate crisis, we often, you know, assume and these conversations come up that we have to change our diets. So that that is the the key part of this. And we want to nourish people. We want to eat foods that are better for us and, and the planet. But this is going to look very different in different regions of the world. And, and David, I'm hoping you can take this on first because that culture, you know, 
food is so significant to everyone, you know, for for so many reasons. But there's, uh, you know, so many cultural reasons for you know eating different kinds of food and when we tell people hey you have to stop eating red meat or you have to stop eating fish or whatever you know we're telling them you know from one week to another that can look very different can you talk about why culture is important yes i mean food brings us together there's a strong cultural aspect there's religious aspect um it's part of all the family and all the community but also food nourishes us so we want a healthy diet a balanced diet and today in the world, we are a situation where, yes, you have some uh, countries and some people that are over consuming meat, but you have also a lot of people that are actually don't have enough micronutrients. And if you're in Africa today, the best way to get micronutrients to kids is with milk, is with eggs, is with meat. Maybe in 35 years, they will get 45 cereals at breakfast, <laughs> but not today. Yeah. And we cannot let kids malnourish. So really, we have to basically manage over the next 25 years this rebalancing and we need to engage with everyone. And the goal is not to say, stop eating that, right. but more start to eat in a more reasonable manner, in a more healthy manner. It's good for you. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, it can be good for the planet. I like that. But the, we should not go to extreme. Right, I like the rebalancing. Richard? Yeah, we often seem to view tradition as immutable. Um, and there's a view that mm. there are certain things that have never changed. And we've always had the ability to, you know, the beef on the table on Sundays, for example. and it. Actually, when we look at it, many things are changing, especially with a, a new generation of people coming through who are a lot more aware. And so there is an, there is an underlying constant change in the cultural dynamic, which is very, not re very much not reflected in the political assumption that there are these immutable truths there. I mean, David's point on the, the nutrition is so important. Um, and, and also there is a view, I think, that people will want there are enough people who will want to do the right thing ultimately they will want to make a positive change for themselves whether it's for sustainability whether it's for their own health if we can badge that again less as fear-mongering less as we're yeah. all going to die if you if you yeah. eat another slice of beef and more as a positive change leave a little impact step by step and uh, that i think in the, especially in the developed western rich world that's probably a better narrative the most important challenge is elsewhere to be honest yeah yeah this is, this is for you both, but David, when we last spoke, we talked about there's a lot of infighting in food and agriculture movements, right? There's a lack of civility. Is, is, the, is the, the arguments that we're having about the right path and the right words to use keeping us back? And, and, and how, if it is keeping us back, how can we get out of that sort of traje trajectory? So there is not the right path. There is not the silver bullet that will solve uh, everything. Uh, when people say, I have the solution, I start to get very nervous <laughs> because it means that the other didn't have, uh, and especially more in someone that I've never been on a farm. That's a bit <laughs> sometimes what's happening. Right on. So, um, so that's why I think we, we need to contextualize this solution and we need to respect the different people. Large corporations, small holders, they don't wake up saying we are going to make people sick or are going to destroy the planet. <laughs> they all try to do their business, basically, and small farmers are businessmen. It's a very difficult job. They have to do accounting, they have to do biology, they have to produce, they have to sell. So we have to, to respect them. So I think that's, yes, we have to stop with ideology. It's more easy to, to say than to do. Mm. Uh, but at the end, what is at stake is what we put in our plate, the food for us, for the kids, but also that, you know, we have one planet. Uh, and we are going to be 10 billion on this planet. And it's not, you know, maybe 8 million people in New York that will drive the narrative. And so we have to listen to these different yeah. voices yeah. all around the place to find this diversity of solution. I really think that and it's a good, that's good risk management, you know. You don't yeah. put all your eggs in the same basket. And that's the same thing for solution. I love it. Diversity of solutions, diversity of thought, diversity of practices. We need all of those things. Richard? Just also thinking about building momentum rather than hitting the perfect direction. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're a Google Maps world now. So to, you know, to get down here, I knew precisely how many steps I would have to take pretty much from the subway to here. Now. This change isn't, isn't like that. Um, you know, when I, we first started having the conversations with large global companies about re Regen Ag, they were saying, OK, you're going to run a pilot. Precisely how many tons of carbon am I going to be able to attribute to that first crop in three years' time? OK, but you really don't get this, do you? Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a case of building momentum. We, we all we know at the moment, we've got a 360-degree compass. We're agreeing we need to go north. 
So let's just start moving north and we will refine our journey as we go. And that mindset, I, I see some great companies who are doing this now. And it, am I allowed to call out individual companies? Of course. General Mills, big US company, maybe not everybody's friend, but they, they at the highest level have said, we're gonna move away from attribution of value, i.e. carbon counting, to contribution to impact. So they've, they've backed off all of their carbon targets in region ag and just said, we're gonna focus on contribution to impact. And that to me was really powerful. When I first heard that from a company that size, albeit they're privately owned, so I think that helps. So that, this idea of move to contribution to impact collectively and think about direction and momentum rather than exactly how much carbon am I gonna claim in my CSRD is a, is a really valuable mindset shift. I love that, thank you for sharing that. So I've ended every panel I think today it's hard to remember <laughs> with the call to action. But I think for the both of you, it's really important because you're such leaders in, in, in different ways. So Richard, what's your call to action to this audience and the people listening online? And thank you listeners online. Probably just come back to the momentum thing. It's, it's really, we, as humans, we're trained right from primary school to try to be right. Mm. You know, what's the right answer to this? The test, the math, the science, it's all about being right and holding back until you are right. Forget that. We're not gonna be right, we're gonna be mostly wrong, but directionally appropriate. So <laughs> just think personally, what can I do just to move in the right direction and build that coalition of movement in the right direction? And I think we'll, we'll start to feel we're going in the right direction together. And it's a very different feeling. I love that, directionally appropriate. I'll try to be that, D David, last word. No, exactly on that, and small progresses every year mm -hmm. is much better than or the big revolution or the big jump in 10 or 15 years. Because we, don't, we cannot wait 15 years. Right. We cannot continue to emit the same amount of carbon, or we cannot have kids that doesn't have good food every day because they will pay the price of their life. So we do this, and we also all have to accept that we will never get what we want. We have to make compromises, and we just want to have something we can live with. And if at the end we are all a bit upset, that's already good. Yeah. If we are, agree yeah. on moving together. And we need something we can live with, literally. Thank you, David. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. Give them a round of applause. What a fun conversation. Thank you both.